time as possible. I've asked Jean Bolger to introduce our speaker tonight. We so appreciate David coming here at no cost to us. So we thank him very much for his, his time. That is a true patriot. Um, and I'm asking Jean to introduce him because she's a longtime friend. Maybe we should have talked to check with David to see if there was a bill. Right? <laughs> um, yes, David um, Baldinger has been an active, busy, busy, busy man. Been all over the place. Love to have his mileage for chart, I'll tell you. Uh, he is a full-time volunteer taxpayer advocate and a political activist from Berks County whose exclusive focus is the elimination of school property tax. <laughs> and educational finance reform. He became involved in the effort in uh, tw 2004 during work with former state representative Sam Rohr and our gubernatorial candidate. Since then, he has become one of Pennsylvania's leading experts on property tax elimination issues. David administers the Pennsylvania Taxpayers Cyber Coalition, a web... Uh, Boy, with my mouth, I need to get louder. I can't believe it. <laughs> okay, I'm a post. Um, a web-based taxpayers organization and is a founder and organizer of the Pennsylvania Coalition of Taxpayers Association, PCTA, a statewide alliance of 65 advocacy groups that are working as one, of one for elimination of school property taxes. So with that, I give you David Baldinger. Yeah. a moment to get settled in here. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight and thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, this is a really important issue and as Jean said, this has been very important to me since 2004 when I start, first started working with Sam Rohrer on it. The more I learned about it, the more I realized just how precarious the situation we're in because of property taxes. I'm going to try to tell you a bit about it tonight. PCTA is uh, our statewide organization, as Jean said, 65 taxpayer groups, all united behind a single plan to eliminate school property taxes in Pennsylvania. Back in 2004, we were six groups meeting in Sam Rohrer's office. And to show how important this is to residents of the state, we've grown to 65 groups in the past seven years. PTCC is my group. Um, it's a web and email based group for those who don't have a local group available to them. And if you will, on the way out, I'd appreciate it if you just give me your email address and the sign-up sheet. I don't want any other information, just so we can keep you informed on what's going on. Go ahead, Janice. I thoroughly believe you can't come up with a solution unless you understand the problem. And most of our legislators, I think, don't really understand the problem. So I'm going to start you off with a few numbers. Anybody have any idea what those numbers are? $24 billion is the total cost of K-12 education in Pennsylvania today. The annual average rate of increase historically is about six and a quarter percent. If you use that as a constant and extend it out, you'll find that in 10 years, the total cost of education is going to be $44 billion. Unsustainable. There's no way we can keep up increases at this rate. Every year when I go to pay my property taxes, I go on the very last day of the rebate period and I have a chat with the tax collector because she's very friendly and uh, likes to give me information. She told me this year, as of August 30th, the last day, revenues were down considerably compared to last year because of assessment appeals. Many people complained about taking out reverse mortgages, which to me is unconscionable. You work your entire life to build security, make a home for yourself, and then as you get older, you have to reverse mortgage it just to pay your property taxes. And she said more people are starting to use the payment plan rather than paying it in one lump sum. There's another number for you. Have any idea about that one? Starting in 2013, the pension bomb kicks in. And we're going to see massive increases, and the legislature has done nothing to prevent local school boards from increasing property taxes to meet their pension obligations. 30% is the increase you could see in the next few years in your property taxes. I'm assuming a lot of you are here tonight because you already have problems with the property tax. What are you going to do when a 30% increase kicks in? We're also going to have reduced funding from the basic education subsidy. That's what happened this year. And that is also going to exacerbate the problem. And I have one final number for you. 
I always have an exhibit I show, and I generally get some gasps when I show it. This was in the Reading Eagle, Berks County, August 17th. Those are tax sales, not foreclosures, sales for non-payment of property taxes. Another sheet on the back, and there was actually another full sheet besides this. Just under 1,100 tax sales in Berks County alone. I have a similar sheet from Schuylkill County, another one from York County. That 10,000 number is the approximate number of homes in Pennsylvania that are sheriffed each year because of non-payment of property taxes. Worse, more people sell their homes when they can to try to avoid having their home sheriffed. I have no idea what that number is because there's no way of telling. This has got to be stopped. So what we're going to talk about is education finance reform, which is really what this is all about. Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which our office holders are sworn to uphold, guarantees that we will be secure in our property. Yet the same politicians who took this oath will allow us to be forcibly driven from our homes if we don't pay our rent to the government in the form of property taxes. Myth number one is that property taxes are the problem. Property taxes aren't necessarily the problem. Go ahead, Janice. Property taxes began in feudal England in the Middle Ages because the landowners were the people with money. The serfs didn't have any, so they taxed you on what they felt was the value of your land. We imported this into Pennsylvania in the early 1800s because at that time we were an agrarian society. You weren't required to report your income to anyone. So the easiest way to assume someone's income was to look at the amount of land they held. A farmer that was farming 40 acres was assumed to be making less money than the farmer who farmed 400 acres. And you were taxed on that basis, which was really a proxy for the income tax. It's ludicrous that we are still taxed as if our properties generate income for us. They don't. We live in them. Why should, why should the property we live in be, be equated with the amount of money we earn? The tax system besides that violates one of the, the property tax system violates one of the basic principles of taxation, and that's that any tax system should account for a person's ability to pay. The property tax system doesn't do that in any way whatsoever, especially with seniors who are on fixed incomes. That property tax has no relationship to their earnings. There's also problems with the assessment system. Property taxes are inherently arbitrary and unfair, and I always use our own personal example. Berks County last reassessed in 1992. We live in a cookie-cutter development. Same basic square footage for all the houses, same lot size, pretty much the same style. Yet somehow, our house was assessed at $25,000 more than our neighbor's house. Now, we appealed it, got a few thousand dollars knocked off, but it had lawyer's fees, we had to have the house appraised, so we had proof when we went to, get, uh, to appeal the assessment. Why are we using a system like this? It's like a sales tax on your mortgage payment every month. We also have out of control spending. I'm not one to bash school board members. I think they work hard, it's a thankless job, but during the primary election, we saw all the candidates for school boards in Berks County. They were published in the Reading Eagle. And they give a, some background on each one. The cross-pollination was amazing. You have a teacher in this district, district whose husband is a school director in this district. You have former administrators running for school board. Then you have the helicopter parents who want to make sure the school board does what they want them to do for their children. Most of these school board members have an agenda that has nothing to do with taking care of the taxpayer. But beyond that, many of them are not educated in finance. They're looking at multi-million dollar budgets they have to handle and don't really understand the intricacies of doing it. This is part of the reason why we're seeing the runaway property taxes as well. Education, and go back up please, Dennis. Education and taxation inequities. I'll give you an example of how bad it is across the state. Let's go, the 1991 form, the funding formula held all schools harmless, meaning that they would get the same relative amount of money in perpetuity. Berwick School District in Columbia County has lost 900 students in the past 10 years. In the same time, they've managed to hire 40 new teachers. Their total school budget is uh, financed 40% by property taxes. The rest comes from the state. They are awash in money and the residents pay hardly anything in property taxes. Sw swip uh, switch that around, I know in Bucks County you have problems. In York County, York Suburban School District, 89% of the school budget is financed through property taxes. It's insane. And, well, and now, one more thing I'll mention, that's farms. Anybody know what the, what the number one industry in Pennsylvania is? It's agriculture. We're not talking about 
huge agribusinesses like Archer Daniel, Mid Daniels Midland, we're talking about small family farms that have been in families for generations. It's like a death of a thousand cuts for these people. Every year, farmers are selling off an acre or two here and there just to be able to pay their property taxes. We are killing the largest industry in Pennsylvania through property taxes. What are the real problems? An irreparably broken K-12 public education finance system that needs to be fixed now. Myth number two, property tax relief or property tax reform is the, is the solution. How many of you, are, of you are satisfied with the property tax relief you've gotten from gambling money? <laughs> yeah, isn't it great? This was supposed to be the, all the relief we were going to see. It was going to be great. In fact, I think Governor Rendell said he could do 50% reduction standing on his head and said that some people were going to have their property taxes eliminated completely. Well, go ahead, Janice. Here's the truth about it. Act 50, Act 72, Act 1 were all different flavors of the same thing. They called for a local tax shift from property taxes to a local earned income tax. Act 50 and Act 72, the decision was up to local school boards. It was rejected soundly across the state. Then in 2007, we had the referendum for Act 1. Taxpayers in the district were allowed to vote on whether or not they wanted to shift part of their property taxes to a local earned income tax. Only five districts of then 500 in Pennsylvania approved the shift. Somehow, legislators assumed that because this happened, people preferred the property tax instead. In fact, that came from Senator Dominic Pelleggi of Delaware County. Governor Rendell said at the time the people were stupid. I'm sorry. It wasn't they didn't understand. It wasn't that they were stupid. They understood the real problem. You take a shift to a local earned income tax, okay. You get a temporary reduction in your property taxes, but those property taxes just keep going up and up and up, and pretty soon you're right back where you were before, but with a new tax to pay. Former HB 1600, same thing. This was introduced uh, last session by David Lebdansky of Allegheny County. It's been reintroduced this session. I don't even bother with the bill number because it's so disgusting. Mario Scabella from, uh, from uh, Monroe County introduced it this time. What it calls for is a half a percent increase in the sales tax, a quarter percent, roughly a quarter percent increase in the earned income tax, and it gets you a $400 rebate. But it doesn't do anything to cap property taxes. So it's the same situation. Property taxes go up. You're right back where you were. Now you have two new taxes to pay. The Act 1 rebates I already mentioned. I know you're really happy with that, because I am. The homestead exclusion I'll just mention briefly. This is something the legislature came up with about 10 years ago to offer property tax relief. And what the homestead exclusion says, the legislature, if they choose, can exclude up to 50% of the median assessed value in every school district from property taxes. But when you think about that for a second, let's, let's assume the median assessed value is $100,000. If your home is assessed at $100,000, you'll see a 50% reduction. If your home is assessed at less than $100,000, you're going to see a huge reduction. But don't be assessed at more than $100,000 because you're going to see practically nothing. And this is really a redistribution of wealth. That's what it comes down to. But they enacted this through a constitutional amendment but never acted on it. There was never any legislation to enable the constitutional amendment, and that was 10 years ago. The re any relief is going to be quickly outstripped by relentlessly rising school property taxes. So there's our mantra. No relief, no reform, no reduction. Eliminate the school property tax. Drive a stake through it and end it forever. Go ahead. This poor guy has been sitting around for 30 years. And that's how long it's been since we've been discussing property taxes. The legislators tell us this is a complex problem that's not easily resolved. Well, I'm sorry. I don't want to hear that. As far as I'm concerned, this is nothing more than a whiny excuse to absolve them from not taking, taking effective action. It's totally untrue. What they need is the courage and the political will to ignore the special interests, <laughs> ignore the partisan politics, and do what is right for the taxpayers who elected them. And somehow we're always the last ones to be taken care of. Now, this plan has been around since 2004 when Sam Rohr first introduced it. And over that time, legislators have said, taxpayers aren't going to accept the kind of massive change that we're talking about. That's another excuse. Because I've given this talk, I can't tell you how many times. Sam did it for years before me. And when people have heard it, they've always said, as long as the tax that replaces the property tax is fair and the property tax is completely eliminated, they stand 100% behind it. I don't want to hear the excuses from the legislators anymore. 
So now, why now is the time for change? Well, first of all, rising homeowner discontent. I know you folks are unhappy. I'm unhappy. People all over the state are unhappy about the property tax situation. 2011, 2012, 228 districts were granted, granted referend, uh, referendum exceptions. They could just go to the Department of Education and say, hey, we need a property tax increase above the Act 1 index for this reason. And PDE rubber stamps and says, yeah, go ahead. We saw increases as much as 10% in the past couple of years. PDE has never rejected an exception to the referendum. We see minimal relief, relief from gambling money and the Act 50, Act 72, and Act 1 failures. Quinnipiac Polling Institute is from Massachusetts. They poll the state regularly on various issues. The last time they polled about property taxes was in 2008. And in that time, 89% of Pennsylvanians said property tax reform was urgent, the number one issue among Pennsylvania voters. And still, the legislature refuses to acknowledge it or do anything about it. Now, to cap that off, we have the Allegheny County court ruling. This happened two years ago. Allegheny County residents sued the county for a reassessment. They said the home values were out of whack. They wanted to make it more fair. More fair. Um, the Allegheny County at the time refused to do it, so they took it to court. Judge Stanton Weddick ruled at the time that, yes, the assessment system is unfair, and the way to correct it is more frequent reassessments. Commonwealth Court upheld that decision, so Allegheny County is now going through a reassessment along with a number of other counties in the state. What it boils down to is, in order to meet the letter of Stanton Weddick's order, you're looking at a reassessment about once every three to four years. The average countywide reassessment costs $10 million. That's going to be paid for through increased county property taxes every three or four years to try to fix a system that's broken. It's insanity. Pressure from taxpayers groups in the media, and we've seen it. We've gotten word back from Harrisburg that some of the legislators are getting really twitchy. They don't like seeing us at 65 groups. When we were back two dozen or so, we weren't a big deal. We've spread across the state. We picked up Joe Gable, help me here. What have we had? Maybe 15 new groups from Western Pennsylvania in the past six months? The past six months, it's, uh, I think it's about 17. We've had tremendous growth. Like numbers, and the legislators are kind of twitchy about it. They don't like to see this kind of activity. When they're awake. Pardon? When they're awake. And the biggest issue we have right now is the diminishing opportunity to fund property tax replacement from a state level source. Sam's original plan in 2004 called for expanding the base of the sales tax to everything. It would have completely eliminated the property taxes and we could have reduced the sales tax rate to 4%. Now an expansion of the base alone is not enough to cover it just because property taxes have gone up so much. And you'll hear why when I talk about the plan. Go ahead. Finally, 2011 American Ex Legislative Exchange Counselor, Alec, Every year they do what they call the Rich States, Poor States Report, and it ranks all the states based on economic performance. Pennsylvania is 43rd in economic competitiveness, 46th in economic performance, and 41st in out-migration. I'm going to quote from Anthony Davies. Anthony Davies is a professor of economics at Duquesne University. He described Pennsylvania's out-migration problem as a symptom of increasing property taxes, which along with increased income taxes affects where young college graduates choose to move and live. His quote, they can go anywhere they want. So of course the states that are going to attract them on average are the states with lower property taxes. Property taxes are killing Pennsylvania's economy, driving away its residents. It's destroying us, if you let the, yet the legislature refuses to see this. It makes me crazy when they talk about giving us property tax relief, we're going to see a lot of things come up this fall. The plan I'm going to talk about tonight, there's also one in the hopper, I believe, for uh, tax freeze for seniors, uh, property tax elimination for seniors, a local tax shift based on an earned income tax. The one that's really nuts is a local tax shift based on sales tax. A county by county referendum would decide whether or not you can increase the sales tax in that county by 1%. Part of that money would be used to offset property taxes. But what happens, okay, here in Bucks County, you pass a 1% sales tax surcharge. Lehigh County, they don't. Where are you going to go to buy your next car? <laughs> it's insane that they should even consider something like that. But the worst part is it just proves they don't understand the problem. 
Stop trying to stick band-aids on a hemorrhage, solve it, and get rid of the property tax. And that's the answer. Replace the school property tax with a more broad-based, equitable funding stream. Uh, it isn't necessary for me to say much more about that, but I will mention, Governor Rendell said during his administration that you've got to keep the property tax because it makes homeowners more responsible. I have yet to figure that one out, but that's a quote from him. Pardon? Yeah, honestly, it makes you more responsible. Here's the answer to it. The Property Tax Independence Act, you're going to love it, House Bill 1776. Isn't it great? This is based roughly on Sam Rohrer's plan, but a lot, of, a lot of changes had to be made just because the finances didn't work from Sam's original plan. What you're going to see tonight is the way the proposal will be written. The bill should be introduced before the end of November, and we're going to need help from everyone to get your local legislators onto that bill, and more importantly, to vote for it when it comes to the floor. Bucks County legislators over time have proven they do not support this concept. Joe, you're shaking your head. You understand that. And it's time to squeeze them and let them know this is unacceptable. We've got to get this done, and we've got to get it done now, and we don't want to hear their excuses anymore. I personally think the problem with Buck's legislators was the John Prezell influence. He's not around anymore. They really have no reason to use that as an excuse. This is the only proposal the PCTA supports. 65 grass grassroots taxpayer groups are behind this, this bill. Accepted wisdom says property tax is the most stable tax. Maybe that was true in the past, because if you didn't pay it, they were going to kick you out of your house. That's been proven wrong, and it has gotten worse and worse. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. In Berks County, there's a place called the Highlands of Wyoming Missing. It's a uh, senior living facility. Last year, they appealed their assessment. It was granted, and the Wyoming Missing School District lost $250,000 a year in property tax revenue. Worse, closer to home for you guys, is Upper Marion. GlaxoSmithKline has a huge facility in Upper Marion. They appealed their property taxes back in 2008. Upper Marion, of course, went after them and said, no, we can't have, have this happen, and they, they uh, of course, opposed the appeal. The appeal was granted last year. Because of it, the Upper Marion School District is going to lose $2 million a year in school property taxes. That's going to have to be paid by the homeowners, the taxpayers, in increased property tax rates. What made it worse was because the appeal was originally filed in 2008 but finally granted in 2010, Upper Marion had to rebate two years' worth of property taxes to GlaxoSmithKline, $4 million in one lump sum. Delaware County, you've got the Sunoco Marcus Hook Refinery, Conoco, they're both closing down. People are, their, their property taxes are going away, and the people who were employed by them are going to be leaving. The school districts in Lower Delaware County are going to get hammered by this, but still we're told property taxes are the most stable tax. So here's the plan. Total elimination of the school property tax, the earned income tax, and the Act 511 taxes. For those of you who don't know what the five Act 511 taxes are, Act 511 was enacted in 1965. It was a basket of 10 different taxes, a mercantile tax, an earned income tax, a real estate transfer tax, a privilege to work tax. Um, oh, I, the one I really like is the per capita tax. That's the one you pay just because you live and breathe. This drives away all those taxes except the local real estate transfer tax. For all entities in the taxing body, with one, one specific exception that I'll get to in a minute. There have been arguments to eliminate only for homeowners. That's not going to solve the problem. Beyond that, in order to eliminate for homeowners and still leave property taxes on business, you have to have a constitutional amendment anywhere from a three to five year process, if it goes through. We're saying we don't need this, this is too urgent, let's do it now. But besides that, in this year's budget, the legislature finally continued the phase out of the capital stock and franchise tax, which is great for big corporations in Pennsylvania. 80% of non-government employees in Pennsylvania are employed by small businesses who aren't helped at all by the capital stock and franchise tax phase out. This would be huge for small businesses in Pennsylvania just eliminating the property tax. We've been told by a number of small businesses that if they lost their property tax, by the way, the property tax is the second largest fixed cost for small businesses in Pennsylvania. You get rid of that tax burden on them, they've told us. We will expand, we will hire more new employees, but at this point we can't afford to do it, especially since property tax increases are going to be so uncertain over the coming years, 
we can't take the risk of expanding knowing we're going to get taxed even more. This is why we favor the elimination of the property tax for everyone, not just homesteads and farmsteads. Total elimination to be phased in over two years. Year one after enactment, freeze. Year two after enactment, the property tax goes away, except for one small portion. This, too, was due to the rise in property taxes and the ability to fund them from a state source. It was also political concerns. One of the big objections we had to the plan in the past was from people in smaller school districts that were financially responsible complaining that they would have to pay off huge amounts of debt for districts that were fiscally irresponsible, like Philadelphia, for example. So there will be a small remnant of property tax remaining, and that will be used to pay off any existing debt in each school district. It will vary by school district, but on average, 10% is the amount of, of property tax used for long-term debt in school districts in Pennsylvania. Maximum is 18%. Meaning at the end of two years, worst case scenario, the people with that kind of debt will see an 82% reduction in their property taxes. On average, you'll see a 90% reduction in your property taxes. And once the long-term debt is paid off, it goes away completely. It's the easiest way to work the bill because the debt, pay, debt service right now in Pennsylvania for all school districts is about $2.3 billion. And we would have had to make that up from a statewide source. Better to leave it with the school districts. They're the ones who incurred the debt in the first place. Let them pay it off. Total elimination of school board taxing ability. No more can they levy taxes on you without your approval. There's a specific exception to that. You can't leave the school boards twisting in the wind. There are legitimate reasons for them to impose a tax. They need a new school. School needs major repairs. They want to ask for a football field or build a new swimming pool. Well, that's questionable. The bill will allow them to impose a local earned income tax, but with a no exception taxpayer referendum only. If it's for a special project, like I mentioned, a new school repairs, they have to tell you the purpose of the project, the cost, the tax to be imposed, and a sunset date for the tax so you know when you'll stop paying it. If it's for ongoing expenses, fine. You can do that as long as you approve it in referendum. And that referendum has to be reinstated every four years to make sure the tax doesn't go on in perpetuity. That's the one exception we allow that will allow taxation. Looking for stabilization of school funding. I already told you about Upper Marion. We're seeing this all over the state. This stabilizes school funding because the school boards are going to get a, predict a predictable source of revenue that they know from year to year they can depend on. And to establish realistic limits in K-12 spending. I'm going to tell you how we do that. Go ahead, Janice. First of all, most important thing, the tax swap must be revenue neutral. First of all, it's got to be fair to the taxpayers. But second, the governor has signed the Americans Ta for Tax Reform pledge not to increase taxes. Anything that is not revenue neutral but is actually a tax hike, the governor won't sign. So it's got to be tax neutral. We're talking about a moderate expansion of the sales tax base that will include more items and services. I don't have the list with me, but I think it includes about 18 items. Also included is a tax on any food item not on the WIC list. And the WIC list is basically fresh meats, produce, dairy, certain packaged foods that don't contain extra sugar or other adulterants. Um, an increase in the rate of the sales tax to 7% from the current 6%. An increase in the state personal income tax rate from the current 3.07 to 3.99. That is essentially a dollar for dollar swap for the elimination of the local earned income tax and the local Act 511 taxes. That's pretty much dollar for dollar across the board. And any money you're currently getting in that great property tax relief from gambling will go into the pot to help finance property taxes. Go ahead, Janice. The bill will call for all property tax replacement revenue to be placed in a segregated lockbox account. And I know that always draws groans when I say it, because we've seen what's happened to Social Security. But it's the best we can do at this point to at least guarantee the money will not get commingled with the general fund. So it is calling for a segregated lockbox account that can't be touched for anything but replacing property taxes. Further, it's possible that a fund balance can accrue over time. If that happens, the bill calls for either a reduction in the income tax rate or a reduction in the sales tax rate if the, the fund balance exceeds 6% of the total revenue necessary. That's a guarantee you're not going to get overtaxed. Now you go look at the other side of the equation, how the schools are funded. 
Initially, all schools are going to be funded for the total amount of property taxes eliminated, not just property taxes, all the taxes. Dollar for dollar, they will get back whatever they've lost in local tax revenue. At the same time, they're going to be required to establish a baseline average daily membership. How many students go to school there? Divide that number into the cost of property taxes. That's going to give you a number that it costs for each to educate each, educate each student. Then annually, that number is reviewed along with their budget. If they've gained student population, the school district will get an increase in funding based on their per pupil cost. But like the Berwick School District, if they've lost student population, they're going to see a reduction in their subsidy or their replacement property taxes. The only fair way to do it. This is not a complicated formula, and we're doing everything we can to assure that the legislature doesn't start tinkering with it, because the legislature likes to mess with this kind of stuff. They use all sorts of strange metrics when they come up with these formulas that make no sense whatsoever, and somehow in the end, they manage to favor Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, while the center of the state gets practically nothing. Go ahead, Janice. And one thing uh, we did mention, a re reasonable uh, minimum student population trigger level has to be established for this. Doesn't do much good to increase or decrease a, uh, a school district's funding based on five students moving out of the district in a year. Annual funding increases. This too, no silly formulas. Annual funding increases based on the increase in the consumer price index, a measure of infl inflation. If the CPI goes up 3%, then the school districts each get a 3% increase in their budget. No messing around with, well, see, we have to consider the uh, community wealth and how much taxes are already paying and the special ed costs and 3% across the board or whatever the CPI is that this year. Let's not mess with it. Go ahead. Supplemental school funding through a local earned income tax and a personal income tax. We can skip that. I already explained that to you. I got ahead of myself. Go ahead. The legislation is to be implemented for replacement of local school district taxes only not to be integrated in any way with the basic education subsidy. That funding continues in whatever form is determined by the General Assembly. Sam's plan originally called for rolling all financing into one big pot and driving it out to the schools. The legislature doesn't like that. They like to tinker with this. So what we're saying is, okay, you've got the basic education subsidy. We don't want to get involved in it. There's your sandbox. Go play in it. Do what you want to do but get the property taxes eliminated and keep it simple. And they like to play with it. And again, I hate to keep banging them in Philadelphia, but we saw during the Rendell administration, Philadelphia was just funded so hugely while everybody else suffered for it. To go along with it, a separate concurrent legislation proposing a constitutional amendment to forever abolish property taxes as a school funding source. Anything enacted by statute, like this plan, can also be unenacted by statute. We want to guarantee that that can't happen. And over the three to five year period, we're going to try to push through a constitutional amendment to forever abolish property taxes as a school funding source. The bill has been vetted against actual and estimated revenue and expenditure figures supplied by the Pennsylvania House Appropriations Committee. Jim Cox has really gone off the reservation with this. Most legislators don't like their colleagues working closely with taxpayer groups, groups like us. Jim has worked very closely with us on, on this. Um, over the past, well, up until last week, Jim and I, in a two-week period, probably spent 30 hours e together either in his office or on the phone going over all the financials for this. It is dead on. We need $12.8 billion, and it is right on the money. So if any of your Bucks legislators try to tell you that the plan doesn't work financially, because that was always used as an excuse to not enact Sam's plan. Oh, it doesn't work financially. That was a lie that became the truth over time. Anybody tries to tell you the plan doesn't work financially, they're wrong. We know it does. I've seen the numbers. There's no question about it. Go ahead. So in wrap-up, you have the sheets that, that um, uh, were passed out tonight. Five, uh, ten reasons to eliminate the property tax. First, you achieve true home ownership. You never own your home as long as it can be taken from you for non-payment of taxes. You might have the deed, you might have the mortgage, it's still not your home because the state can come in and take it from you at will if you don't pay your taxes. And you want to get sick to your stomach, go to the PCCC website, the address is on all those sheets, take a look in the right-hand column, the letter that I received from a sheriff's deputy 
who was responsible for going out and seizing homes for, for, for non-payment of property taxes. It is appalling, the brutality. And it's not because the sheriff's deputies are so brutal. It's the rules they have to follow. Read it, and you're going to see why this has to be taken care of. Stabilize school funding. We already talked about that. We know why. Help prevent foreclosures. People have said to me, okay, there are folks who've gotten themselves into their own mess by taking out a mortgage they couldn't afford. And that may be true, but so what? That's not the issue. Fact is, they're in that mess, and every time a house is foreclosed, it hurts our economy. If you get rid of that monthly tax escrow, which in some places can amount to as much as 30 or 40 percent of a mortgage payment, get rid of that monthly tax escrow, how many people would be able to stay in those homes when all they had to pay was the mortgage? Rest restore plummeting real estate values. This is another one that makes people gasp when I tell them about it. Monroe County is the poster child for this, but it's happening all over the state. And I mention it because we have a group up there who pretty much keeps us informed of what's going on. Monroe County has had a huge influx of people from New Jersey and New York over the past few years. Their property taxes have gone through the roof. Median price for a home in Pennsylvania right now is $200,000. A home on the market right now at that price in Monroe County has a total property tax load of $10,000 a year. Their housing market is in the toilet. They can't give their houses away. Who's going to buy a $200,000 house that has a property tax load of $10,000 right now, knowing it's going to go up even further? Mm -hmm. It is killing the real estate market in Pennsylvania. But this also is the, the legislators with blinders on. They don't see that. In fact, Mario Scavello, a representative from Monroe County, who's been in the legislature forever, still wants to look at a local tax shift option. It's right under his nose in his own county, and he still can't see the truth of it. Boost the sagging housing market. I'll go back six or seven years. Our son and his wife wanted to buy a house. They were living in an apartment. They could afford the mortgage payment. This is a <coughs> modest house, nothing elaborate. They couldn't afford the mortgage payment. They could afford the mortgage payment, but as soon as they were told, you have a $400 a month property tax escrow, killed the deal. They eventually bought the house, but the point is, how many more homes could be bought and sold in Pennsylvania with that monthly property tax escrow eliminated? In Monroe County, in that house that I just mentioned, the payment is 43% of their mortgage payment. The taxes are 43% of their mortgage payments. Get rid of that. It would make the housing market in Pennsylvania absolutely explode without the monthly escrow payment. Attract business to Pennsylvania. Number six. Businesses are eager to establish a presence in states where the tax burden is low, uh, is low. We can attract business to Pennsylvania by eliminating the property tax, a huge stimulus for the state's economy. How many of you have heard of KOZs, Keystone Opportunity Zones? Ring a bell with you? You know what they are, Joe. Keystone Opportunity Zones are targeted areas where companies are given property tax abatements for moving into the area. Good example is Cabela's up in Hamburg. They wanted Cabela's in here in the worst way, and it's meant a, 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 a huge amount of revenue for Berks County. Uh, there's been a lot of construction around it, but Cabela's was given a 10-year property tax abatement to attract them here. In Chester County, EA Games moved in a few years, few years back. They also were given a property tax abatement, 10 years. EA Games is a software firm. At the end of the 10-year abatement, almost to the day, you can look this up, 10-year abatement ended, EA Games moved out. Now, if we're willing to choose winners and losers and pick companies that we want to welcome to this state, why not make the entire state a Keystone Opportunity Zone and attract all businesses here instead of trying to choose who we want? Open up the state to more business. Create a massive stimulus for Pennsylvania. Of the current uh, Roughly $12 billion, $13 billion in property taxes, $10 billion of that is paid by homeowners. What are you going to do when that property tax escrow, property tax payment is back in your hands? You're going to save some of it, you're going to give some away, you're going to spend some of it. The federal government borrows to do stimulus programs. We don't have to do a thing. Return $10 billion a year to the hands of taxpayers to spend as they wish and watch what happens to Pennsylvania's economy. It doesn't cost the state a penny to do it. Increase personal wealth. A home purchase is the family's single largest investment. Increased home values, no property tax escrow to pay. Homeowners are going to enjoy a significant boost in personal wealth. And 
With the money you saved on property taxes, you can afford to invest so you have a more secure future for your family. And finally, stock reassessment. This doesn't do it. The county and municipal property tax remain. But 75% of the, of the property taxes you pay on average are the school property taxes. This is a huge first step towards eliminating all property taxes and getting rid of the assessment system, the tax collector system. How much money could we save by doing that? Finally, this is a clean bill, as Sam's was. There isn't much legisla legislation coming out of Harrisburg that doesn't de benefit a special interest or, or another legislator. There's nothing in this bill for that. It benefits the taxpayers and the, and the children of Pennsylvania, and that's it. And we're going to be very vigilant about this and make sure through amendment that don't start sneaking other things into the bill. Go ahead, Janet. I used to hear this all the time. Boy, I really like what I heard. I hope that they'll do something about it, meaning the legislators. Or good luck, I hope you can do it. The legislators aren't going to do anything about it unless you let them know that you expect them to do something about it. Tell them in no uncertain terms, you don't want to hear about any more relief schemes, none of their nonsense. Get this done now while you have the support of the taxpayers. I did a talk in Pittsburgh last Wednesday night. There were three legislators there. One of them was looking at the local tax shift option. I said to him, do you understand you eliminate the property tax? They're going to erect a statue of you. He said, yeah, I guess that's true. I think we changed his mind by having him being there. But the politicians don't quite understand, too. The people who vote for this and get it through are going to be in office for the rest of their lives if they want it. They don't understand what this would mean to the people of Pennsylvania, but I hope that they will do something about it. No, you have to do something about it. And that's part of the reason I'm here tonight, trying to recruit you to join us in what we're doing. And good luck. I hope that you can do it. I can't do it. I need your help and everybody else's help. And if you like what you heard here tonight, join us in what we're doing. Sign up for the PTCC email updates and the sign-up sheet in the back. Tell everyone you know about this. Again, I keep singling you out, Joe, but Joe Gable has been a huge uh, proponent of this bill back since 2004 and has worked hard here in Bucks County to build a coalition of people to get this done. And has beat up in his legislators quite a bit, too. <laughs> they don't like you very much, do they, yes, Joe? Friendly communication. Can I just add one thing? Go ahead, Joe. I, think we're, I know I've invited a number of people <coughs> from the press here, and I've seen some of you scattered around. Although Dan is saying that we have to get out here, we as citizens, and get other people to join us in talking to our legislators, I think it's the obligation of you people with the press. You are our voice, and you've got to start making this an issue. How can you sit there and write about car accidents when 10,000 people lose their homes because of the Commonwealth? That's a major story. Yes, it is. You've got to start identifying stories, right. stories that impact households. I'm, I'm begging the people from the press. I don't even know if anybody from Calkins Media is here, but they've all been invited. Hopefully, some of you are here. Go ahead, Jim. True education finance reform can be achieved with your help, and that's the point. We need your help. 65 member groups, we have pretty much reached critical mass. And we just need a loud outcry from the taxpayers of this state to get this done. And I hope you'll give us your help. Go ahead, Janet. That's us. Web address is on the bottom. I invite you to go to the website. I just updated it last night. It has all the provisions of the plan on it, along with some more detailed information that I, do not, that I did not give to you tonight. There's a lot of information on there if you want to take the time to look it over. Please go to the website, look through it. And again, if you believe in what we're doing, Please try to support us. Anybody have any questions? Whoa, a bunch of them. All right, let's start. You in the back, sir. You were the first one up. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I talked to uh, Paul Clymer at the uh, polls, I guess, last year, and I was talking to him about this. He says, oh, no, no, no we will never vote for that. That's what he said. And he had a problem against with him is nobody runs against him. He always runs. Unopposed. Unopposed. Yeah. Mario Scavello in, um, in Monroe County said the same thing. Oh, they're never going to pass this. I'm sorry. Why don't you work for it? Let's see what happens. What makes you prescient? What makes, how do you know what the outcome is going to be? Instead of giving that as an excuse, get to work and help to get it passed. If you can see the wisdom of this, get your colleagues to support it and vote for it. 
Don't stand there and tell me, oh, it's never going to pass. I'm sorry. I don't want to hear that excuse. And thank you for bringing it up. We, we, we need a candidate to run against him. Yes, you do. Well, he almost retired at the end of last year, didn't he? I'm just saying, Questions? Okay. Yes, ma'am. This wasn't a question, but in answer to him, Scott Petrie always said, you're going to give Wyatt the free reign and not have him pay taxes? You know, it's one of the complaints. How can you do that? How can you give all these businesses non-profit tax? But that's not what I wanted to ask. I have a couple questions for the presentation, and I know you have answers. You talked about uh, the lockbox. Yes. And there would always be money in it. Well, what if there isn't enough money in it? Something's going to have to change. Um, it will be up to the legislature to make sure the schools are fully funded because part of the provisions of the bill are, is that the school will never receive less money than it received in the previous year, except for if they lose student population. So, so the 7% could become 7 and a half or 8 Yes. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Um, I forgot, I, I'm like, uh, Perry, I forgot the other things. Oh, you're having a Rick Perry moment, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, that wasn't your plan. <laughs> I have a funny Senior story to tell you. Before I came here tonight, it, it has happened to me once in a while that I've had a brain freeze during this talk. And I said to my wife tonight before we left, I said, at least I have an excuse now. I can say I'm having a Rick Perry moment. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. I'm an elected school board director in Upper Perkiom, the Upper Perkiom School District. Yes, sir. And I was a vehement supporter of Sam Rohr and this, this bill, this legislation. Uh, I ran for the school board because of a proposed 17% tax increase uh, in the 2009 budget cycle, budget year. I'm almost completed my second year on the board and I voted against the tax increase year one. Good. We had a vote, I don't have a vote for a tax increase. We voted, we had a vote recently, uh, and we voted for a 0% increase in our millage rate, but unfortunately, we were saddled with a 5.37% increase due to the flawed STEM numbers, and most people don't even know anything about the State Tax Equalization Board, but that's a whole other monster that has affected our property values and has skewed the numbers that rely on flawed data, often coming from the county and being mis-, mis interpreted at the state level and really, again, skewing the numbers. Yep. So, um, again, I'm all in favor of this. I've talked to Senator Mensch about this. He has said to me in the past that the numbers do not work. That was his chief complaint against Sam's proposal. Um, I want to see this get the public attention. I want to see it get to the House floor for debate and discussion. Marcy Topol has told me that she will support it if the legislation is brought forward. Bob said he will support it if the companion legislation is brought forward in the Senate floor. But how do we get it from you know, being introduced and then being brought forward to the floor? And what is the time frame uh, that Jim Cox is, expects to introduce this? Because I want to bring this to my community at large. I want to, I want to have a presentation whether you're there and Rep Cox is there and, and Marcy Topol, Bob Mensch, and any other surrounding representatives that would like to come out and hear this, the local Republican club, Good. you know, so on, the local Democratic club, so on and so forth, but all the members of our community, and let's just throw this out, put this on the table community-wide, because the only way it's going to work is you have to get the support, not only of the community, but you need every school district, you need the majority of school elected school board directors in the 500 school districts in this commonwealth to also support this and push this forward. Because what's coming down the pike with the, the, the Peasers fiasco, you know, does this address how do we fund that? Because that's, you know, you mentioned the 30% increase. And all they're doing now is kicking the can down the road. And it's that's going to get ugly. That's an avalanche. Do you think people are being forced out of their homes now? Wait, wait, let's look three years down the road when they can't kick the can any further. So there's a couple questions thrown in there. So how do we get this out? When and when is Jim? going to introduce us with a splash. Okay. Um, the House GOP caucus. Thank you. You're, you're very well. Appreciate it. House GOP caucus is going to have a meeting later this month to decide what they as a caucus want to support for property taxes. So right now, and I think the Democratic caucus is going to do the same thing. Right now, we have to let our legislators know when and if this happens, we don't want to see you supporting any halfway measures anymore. 
If the caucus is going to decide on a plan to support it, by the way, it doesn't matter what the caucus ultimately decides. This plan will be introduced and will come to the floor. Uh, you mentioned getting out of committee. I'm going to get off, off track here for a second. But we're pretty certain we're going to be able to get it out of committee. It will probably go to the Finance Committee. We have some friendlies on the Finance Committee. Pretty sure we're going to be able to get it out. But it would be sure would be nice to have the House Republican Caucus choose this as their preferred vehicle for property tax reform, although I hate to use the word. Something else you mentioned, this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. This is a people issue. It affects everybody. Historically, because it was Sam Rohrer's bill, well, Sam Rohrer was a Republican, so the Democrats can't support it. Nonsense. It has nothing to do with partisan politics. It has to do with saving this state from financial ruin and saving us taxpayers from losing their homes. And we need people from both sides of the aisle to do it. Well, I have the thought. Let me finish what you said. About the Senate. Senator Dave Argall is going to do an introduction of this bill in the Senate. Uh, the way it's looking now, we're going to probably be able to get a simultaneous introduction and maybe a press conference with both Cox and Argall there, which would be tremendous. The bill has never been introduced in the Senate before. So this is going to be a major coup for us. I'm glad that you, as a school director, are willing to speak out for this because this is another excuse we've heard frequently. School directors hate this idea. Well, maybe irresponsible school directors hate this idea, but most school directors we've spoken with have said, give us the money, let us work within a budget, and then let us work on curriculum and educating our children not being fundraisers and having to take heat from taxpayers. Yes, sir. Thank you. I just want to add, in our district, in the last 13 years, we have seen, I'm going to approximate, 49, a 49% tax increase yep. and just in the school portion of our property taxes yep. and I remind them you mentioned that eventually if you, get, if you don't pay your taxes you're removed from your home but let's call it what it is property taxation is theft and you're they're confiscating the wealth and private property of individual property owners and the only way they can do that ultimately is through the force of government and with men with guns Yep. There's always a gun in the room because ultimately if you don't pay, they don't show they don't show up with lollipops and cotton <coughs> candy. They show up with guns right. and you're forcibly removed from your property. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think everybody in the room, that was a great presentation. We'll Thank go you. for what you want to do. My problem is this is covering the problem. The problem is the teachers are getting paid too much money. And the pensions are too much. Yes. And the fringe benefits are too much. Yes. So who's going to solve that problem? Right. This isn't doing anything. It's great. Don't get me wrong. I think it's super. Somebody's got to solve the problem of paying $100,000 a year, working nine months. Okay. Which is a disgrace. Let me, let me respond to that. Yeah, I've heard that forever. I, it's got to stop. I Break the contract. Stop the negotiation. I don't necessarily disagree with you, but I am going to say this. That's more than we want to try to bite off at this point. Yeah, right now, absolutely. the problem is urgent, and we've got to get it done. And every time you add another provision to legislation like this, you give more targets for legislators to shoot at and, and make objections for it. Again, I don't disagree with you. That's just something I don't think we should try to address in this bill. Keep it as simple I'm, as possible and get it done. I'm not saying you should address it. I think that more than okay. one thing can be done in the state at one time. Probably. But let me mention one more thing. For the first time, we, the, the, school board, the school budgets are going to be limited to the increase in the cost of living. Now, that's not going to do anything about current teacher contract or current, uh, current expenses. But, you know, you have the school boards negotiating teachers' contracts, and most school boards don't have the faintest idea about how to negotiate a contract. Meanwhile, the union brings in their high-powered negotiators, and they pretty much overwhelm the school boards. Now, the school boards are going to have to learn how to do it because suddenly, you're seeing a 2% increase in your budget this year. How are we going to afford a 6% salary increase or a pension increase? We better figure out how we're going to do this. And you can't cut, uh, cut academic programs any further because right now, 70, 75% of school budgets go to salaries and benefits, leaving the rest for educational expenses. School boards are going to have to learn in a big hurry how to deal with this. And no, it won't happen immediately. But over time, you're going to see this start to level itself out just because the ability isn't there anymore to raise taxes to cover contracts. Over here, this ma'am. You know what, this is going to come on us faster than we realize what are we going to do with this piece or When, when? The piece or 
if this, this it's going to hammer you. If this is passed, it comes down to two things. Either the local school district has to figure out how they're going to pay for the PISA's increase. They haven't, they have not. They had 10 years to fund this. Yeah. This was legislated. They had 10 years. But they, you know, they, at did this, not, they did not save one cent. At this point, they don't care. I don't know if you, if you, if you know what happened to Act One. Let me, let me back up for a second here. Act One, what was, when it was enacted, um, establishes a, 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 an annual index how much school districts are allowed to raise taxes without going to referendum. But then they allowed 10 exceptions to that referendum. They were, it was so broad you could drive a truck through it. So SB 330 that was passed concurrently with the budget this year eliminated seven of the 10 exceptions, except it left three in place. Grandfathered debt, special education, pension. 60 percent historically since 2007 60 percent of all exceptions granted were granted under one of those three yeah. so sb 330 which was supposed to give us all oh, cost controls was essentially meaningless right. especially if you talk to a financial person in the school district who really wants to be honest because i found one who was willing to talk he said any school district financial person worth their salt can start moving things around internally in the budget uh -huh. and suddenly they suddenly they they have a shortfall in special ed or a shortfall in pension, and they can go right through without a voter referendum and raise taxes as much as they want, and again, have PDE rubber stamp it. Now, to get back to your question, either the school boards are gonna have to find a way to conserve to meet that, or the legislature is gonna have to fund it. This goes through, they no longer have the option of taxing you. They're not worried about it right now because they know they can raise taxes to nail you when it happens. They're not concerned. To pull back to the 501 school districts, if they all got, since it was a legislative increase, if they all got to, together and said, we're not paying. Like two districts can't do it, 10 districts can't do it, 100 can't, but if they all came together and said, we cannot afford this 30% increase. Again, this could force them into it. They said, we can't afford to do this. We just don't have a way That's to do it. The, the peace increase is going to happen before this. Uh, no, actually, no. if we can get it through this year, <laughs> end of 2012, this would take effect. They'll just delay it year after year after well, year like they've been there. Um, this we will not allow them to delay. No, it's got to be done now. The, the pensions they can delay. Oh, sure they will. Yeah. They'll probably kick it down the road again. Sure, they did it before. Am I, am I going on so long here? No, no. OK. No. Yes, ma'am. This, uh, this is not the only problem that I'm seeing happening. Um, we've got elderly losing their homes, but in my case, my parents decided they want to stay in their homes because of the cost of retirement nursing slash nursing homes. So you put an addition on your house. Right. Certain townships and municipalities will not let you collect rent because we had to change our deed to our property in order to allow it to have a private section put onto our house. So then we get reassessed, my yep. husband and I. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We are now paying taxes based on their addition to our property. Yep. Right. And once my parents, which my dad passed away, once my mom then passes away, we are stuck yes. with an addition onto our house that we're now paying higher taxes on and my husband's salary didn't go up and we're now in a, in a house where we almost are forced to leave because we can't afford the addition that got put on the house because we wanted to keep my parents at home sure. because they're stuck with the decision, do you want nursing care or do you want it in the house? Right. And for those of us who are opting to be caregivers are now getting overly assessed mm -hmm. on the additions that have been put onto our houses and yep. then because of changing our deeds, the townships are afraid we're gonna let renters come in and rent these things and make their townships maybe a lot less like a village or a community like they want it to be. I have a couple of comments on that. First of all, by staying in, in at home and being cared for by family, elderly people are less of a burden on society. If they're forced out of their homes and forced into a nursing home or an elder care facility that they can't afford, the state picks up the tab. Right. Much better to keep them in their homes. As far as expanding the house, we've seen it. People are afraid to do remodeling to their house, to put on additions, because they know as soon as they do, they're gonna be reassessed and the property taxes are going up. 
For me, it's at home. Berks County is actually taking aerial photographs of properties. They compare them to prior years. They see, whoa, this house has a new extension on it. Let's get out there and reassess them. And it's not just happening in Berks. This is happening all over we the had state. We assessor come out to the house just because of the permits. The permit Absolutely. The permit applications brought the assessors out. But, but I don't understand why our legislators can't understand what we're saving the, the state by having these people and how how come our local townships can tell us what we can do with our addition or not as far as I mean this is not like it's a property where we're going to allow people to rent from us that we wouldn't want to be no. hooked to our house. But they don't care. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's not like it increased the value of your house and that's all they're worried about. But it did, it, the problem is with the way the house values just came down we put on a hundred fifty thousand dollar addition and guess what we haven't gone up a penny. No. And so what, I mean, it's really, it's really becoming an issue for those of us who are trying to be, to do the right thing right, with our family and our, and our parents. So. Absolutely. The legislators have brought, I heard this comment from, come back from Harrisburg. Now, one of the things that would be taxed under the plan is caskets and burial, burial vaults. Caskets and burial vaults. This is a one-time expense. Let's say the average funeral costs ten thousand dollars, which is high. I think you can do it for six or seven. Let's say it costs ten thousand dollars. Seven hundred dollars in sales tax on it. One-time expense that you don't see anyway. It's in, it comes from your estate. We've had legislators say, "Oh, the funeral director's industry is going to be all over me if we try to tax funerals." I don't care. Right. Exactly. Worry about your taxpayers. Not one small segment of the business community. Sorry. Let me go over here, sir. He asked me. For, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, under what authority does the uh, sheriff uh, confiscate your home? Uh, that, was, that, comes, that comes from the 1947 law that allowed school districts to, um, to levy property taxes in the first place. That's when it originally began. Up until 1947. The Constitution also said you have the right to own property. Well, they say that, but they ignore it. Who right. actually tells the sheriff to do it? The county tax assessor. The county tax assessor sent them out. When the taxes are no longer paid, they tell the sheriff, the sheriff posts the notice in two years. But the sheriff is under the executive branch of the county government. Yeah. Nobody's involved. No. He only answers the He thinks it's unconstitutional. But they don't. They don't. That's the problem. I have a real short question. Uh, what kind of support do you have from uh, the PSBA, and do you have co-sponsors on the bill? How many co-sponsors are there on the bill? Interestingly, the, the, the Jim sent out a co-sponsorship memo six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, Joe, and it was really just based on a concept at that point. He didn't have the bill's language in place, and it wasn't nailed down as tightly as this. This, this was just nailed down two weeks ago. He still drew 38 co-sponsors. There were those who said, I don't want to co-sponsor this bill because I can't see the language. In this co-sponsorship memo, Jim did something that had never been done before in the House. He, one of the problems with Sam's bill was that he wrote the legislation, presented it, and said, I want you to co-sponsor this. There were legislators who wanted input into the bill because it is a big bill. Jim took the opposite approach. The reason we didn't see this introduced last January was because, first of all, he wanted to educate his fellow legislators and then listen to what they had to say to try to incorporate their ideas into the bill. When he came out with a co-sponsorship memo, he said specifically, this is going to be a deviation from what we normally do. I want to hear from you. I want you to sign on as a co-sponsor. Give me your input, and we'll try to make the bill as palatable as possible to everyone so we can get it passed. There were still those, excuse me, who brought up Marcy Tobel? You did. Marcy Tobel is one who said, I can't sign on to that until I see the language. Why not sign on to it and work with Jim? Because that's what he's asking. 38 of your colleagues did it. What's your problem? Now you mentioned the PSBA. We have two entities to worry about here, PSBA and PSEA, the Teachers Union. Pennsylvania School Boards Association opposes this. <coughs> their reason, obviously, they don't want the school boards to lose the ability to tax. But they're out of sync with the individual school board members we've talked with. These people have told us, Give us the budget, let us work within it. The PSBA isn't even listening to their own members. PSEA, Teachers Union, you would think would be a natural opponent of this legislation. In all the time it's been around, they have never come out in opposition to it. I don't think we'll ever see them support it, 
But our theory behind this is, and Sam and I talked about this a number of times, and our theory behind it is, PSEA is not stupid. PSEA leadership knows they could do this in their teachers. We've seen teacher layoffs this year and last year because of declining school budgets. And 100 school, roughly 100 school districts in the state, 20% of all the districts, are currently in financial distress. If, get, if things get any worse, they're going to be taken over by the state. When that happens, all contracts are void. PSEA knows they can lose the teachers' contracts in those districts. They can lose teachers themselves through layoffs, which reduces their income from dues. They're smart enough to understand that this stabilizes school funding, and as long as school funding is stabilized, they keep their membership base, and the dues keep rolling in. I would not be surprised to not hear anything from the PSEA this time either for that very reason. Yes, sir, you've been waiting a long time. I know that you, uh, you want this to be as widely spread as possible. Is it uh, possible that, that people here who know how to do it can, first of all, can it go viral like YouTube, and then can people uh, send people to that YouTube site in order to have this, this uh, you know, get, get on your email list and send people over to see this? Because it, it, it's unfortunate I mean, it's fortunate for 50 or so people that are here, unfortunate that everybody can't see mm -hmm. your very good presentation. Thank you very much for it. Yeah. Thank you. This, this has been, from the very start, has been a grassroots effort. None of us get paid. Everybody does every, everything on their own dime. We don't have a lot, of, a lot of big funding to help us along. And that's why I said tonight, we need everybody's help here. If you just tell five people and tell them to tell five people, we can expand tremendously. We've seen the growth in the past seven years. We are so close now that all we need is you to get out there and tell, boy, I heard this presentation last night. It really makes sense. We got to get this done with you help. Send them to the website. Give them the information. Anything you can do to help, we're more than willing to take your help. Thank you. Back here, I saw a hand somewhere. Let me go to someone else first. I'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. Before we do that, um, we will send you the link to Dan McCabe's uh, video of this presentation. So you will be able to shoot this out to all of your friends. And thank, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much to Dan. Thank and you. Kitchen Table Patriots TV. Uh, right. Right. Okay, ma'am, where were you? I was just, uh, just no, with the block here. Get people to use the tax calculator. Everybody can identify with putting the numbers in from their income and see what your taxes are. You know about that. And I did it. Just <laughs> off the top of my head, I pay $400 a year in sales tax yeah. and nothing else. Um, Thank you. And, and the common person can identify with you. Use Thank the you. tax calculator. Forget all the reading. Use the tax calculator. The website has um, an Excel-based calculator. It was developed by Rick Ritter of our Coatesville Taxpayer Group. Rick is a really bright guy who's CEO of Pennsylvania Insurance Company. Great with numbers. He designed the calculator when we first started doing this. It allows you to enter your income, type of income, whether it's earned, whether, whether it's pension income. Uh, what your current property taxes are, calculates based on average purchases of, of taxable items by people, what your final total tax liability will be if this plan is enacted. Now, I'll caution you right now, since this was just so frequently uh, pinned down, Rick has not had time to um, revise the calculator yet. It will give you a good approximate estimate at this point, but give us a couple of weeks, it'll be tuned up really tight. But yet, go to the website, Go to the calculator, punch in your numbers, and take a look at it. If you don't think this works, take a look at that. You hit it right on the nose. It's amazing what a difference it makes. And the difference is because right now, most of the school burden is being paid by 3.4 million homeowners. We're talking about expanding this out to 3.2, uh, excuse me, 3.2 million homeowners. We're talking about expanding it to 12.4 million residents plus visitors to the state. Because they all pay sales tax. But spread the base as broadly as possible and no one individual has to pay too much that way. Question? Questions? Come back to you. Do we know how this affects nonprofits? Pardon? Do we know how this affects nonprofits? No effect on nonprofits whatsoever. Their exemptions stay in place exactly the same way they are now. The only way it would affect nonprofits is if they sell something that is taxable. taxable. They would have to collect tax on that. Okay. But as far as nonprofits paying the tax, no. Right. They're well, exempt. They don't pay property tax now, but no. I, and I they would and they don't pay sales tax. Fees if, we, if we had any kind of 
Don't any kind of nonprofit <coughs> organization saying, oh, whoa, wait a minute, this is going to make our expenses go higher in other areas. Actually, Pano, the Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofit Organizations, yeah. actually opposed this bill last time it was out. For what reason, I don't know. Okay. I, I, don't, I can't understand so why they would oppose. So we need to educate them as well, all of us that are involved in nonprofits, that they don't have to worry about this bill. No, I mean, at the at, at very worst case scenario for them, they would have to start collect, collecting sales tax on items they sold if they, those things became taxable. Okay. But the state rebates one percent of everything they collect just for the just for the effort put into collecting the taxes. Okay. So it would probably offset any extra expenses they would have. Okay, well that's and places like Goodwill that use point of purchase uh, computers, just program it into the computer. It's not a big deal. It doesn't it doesn't cost them a thing. It doesn't take any effort. It pops out at the end of the month. There it is. Send it in. Okay. Over here, there was a question. Yeah, it was just a comment. Go ahead. There, there are about Of that, I have gone to every single school board meeting for the past 10 years, almost, and it's less than 1% of the residents who show up at those meetings. There is no one. I see that audience by myself. Either, either people are disinterested or they become so jaded by people just government ignoring them and ignoring their wishes. We know that happens. They throw up their hands and say, why should I bother? Because nothing's going to change anyway. And nothing has. No. How do you shine these people back up so I, that they come in? I, I've heard the local option thing saying, well, you know, the school board should still be in control. If you don't like the way they're spending their money, if they're spending your money, kick them out in the next election. Okay, first of all, how many people participate in school board elections? Do you have any idea whatsoever what these people stand for? Well, you might, we just but, very, but very few do. But once they're an officer in either for two or four years, they can do a lot of damage in that time before you have a chance to kick them out. It's been so, a lot of damage. Over here, Jean. Now, I was disagreeing with her. About well, don't weigh that. Board. Yes, ma'am, up, up front. Go ahead. Um, I have two questions. Um, yes. Do any other states have a similar plan in place? And my second question was, the main objection I've heard this uh, to this legislation, and this is from the conservatives. Oh, I like objections. Go ahead. They, they are concerned about the control of the money being the cares for rather than the <coughs> Okay. Let me, let me do, uh, remember the two parts in case you get a brain cramp. Second one first. We hear this argument all the time. Okay, salary, how many, of, uh, how many of you who are still working have seen more than a two or three percent increase in your salary in the past five years? Wow, what a show of hand. How many have seen your property taxes go up by six or seven percent? Yeah, that's worked real well, hasn't it? With the local control? That's the first thing I say, but second, the, the, the distribution to the schools is by formula only. You saw it in the presentation. It's simple. There's nothing complicated about it. They can't meddle with it. The school district is going to know what they're getting. The only thing we're taking away from the school districts, and this negates the idea of, oh, well, we're going to lose local control. The only thing we're taking away from local school districts is the ability to levy a tax. They have a way to do it if they need extra funding through the EIT, the EIT referendum option. and. Once the money is in their hands, there is no mandates. There are no mandates in this whatsoever. The money is theirs to spend as they please. If they're irresponsible, they're going to get themselves in trouble. But the, the bill does not mandate anything, no curriculum, nothing. They get the money, spend it any way you want to, make your own decisions. All we're doing is replacing the property tax with a different funding source. That's nonsense, and I don't like it. I get into it head to head with the Valley Forge Patriots, a guy down there, a couple of weeks ago in a talk. This guy is supposedly a wonderful constitutional conservative, and he and I went at it, but he's a school board member. And he didn't want the school boards to lose the ability to levy taxes. Nonsense. They haven't done such a good job to this point. I think that should be taken away from them. I saw another hand back here someplace. Is that it? The question was, oh. Michigan attempted this uh, six, seven years ago. But they made a mistake and left a remnant of the property tax, not, not like I was describing here, that it goes away eventually. They left a remnant of the property tax in place and eventually killed the plan. <coughs> North Dakota has initiative and referendum, which, by the way, is something we should have in this state. Absolutely. But North Dakota has initiative and referendum. The taxpayers have a question coming up on the June 2012 ballot to eliminate property taxes. So they're going to give it a shot. It's interesting because... That's all the referendum calls for, and the legislature's screaming. I got, I got such a chuckle out of this. We're going to have to find $830 million somewhere. I wish that was our problem. Thank you. Instead of $13 billion. 
But no, North Dakota is trying it too, and I've heard that argument made too. Well, no other states have done it. Why should we do it? Can't we be the first? Wouldn't Can't that be, be novel, the Pennsylvania pioneer and something uh, positive for the taxpayers? And watch and how fast it spreads. But there's, an, there's another reason for this too. Pennsylvania is unique among the states in having a very limited sales tax base. Ours is probably one of the most narrow sales tax bases of any in the country. A lot of places already tax food and clothing and other things. We don't in this state. Which gives us the ability to expand that base and raise huge amounts of revenue that other states can't. And that's a really good reason why we can get it done and others might not be able to because we have a readily available revenue source and we know it's going to be tapped. When Dell tried to do it last in his administration for the general fund, he wanted to expand the sales tax base to, I believe, 25 items just for the general fund. We know it's going to happen eventually. So if it's going to happen, let's put it to a good purpose and eliminate the property tax. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even illegals will have to pay that way. Yep. Okay. Well, absolutely. Even illegals. Okay. illegals under the table transactions, everything. Because you can't afford, you can't avoid point, of, you can't avoid point of purchase tax. Yes, sir. Okay. It's got to be quick. Who? Corbin. Corbin. Um, prior to the election. We were lucky enough to meet for an hour and 15 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one with both Corbin and Dan Honorado. Dan Honorado actually supported it. Yeah, the reason we would not get behind Honorado was because, yes, I support it, but I want to put it to a taxpayer referendum. He said, no possible way. You put this to a referendum, you watch all the opponents come crawling out of the woodwork with all the big money and try to defeat it. We said, this is not going to happen, because, and I hate to say this, but most voters don't really pay all that much attention. And they're going to hear all the conflicting information. They're going to go out there and say, oh, no, I can't vote for this. Boom, done. Corbett, on the other hand, he heard the presentation, and I quoted to him one of the things we heard frequently. You're nothing more than a bunch of whiny blue hairs. And I said, I hope you understand that we're more than just whiny blue hairs. He said, I understand, and I hope you understand that I'm interested. Jen Brandstetter, who is his chief of staff, has promised us that if the bill makes it, to, makes it through the legislature, that Corbett will sign the bill. Now, this didn't come from Corbett itself. It came from one of his advisors, so take it for what it's worth. But Brandsetter told us that on two different occasions that this would happen. I got a quick story to tell you about this. It's kind of cute and you might like it. <coughs> two weeks before the election, um, we absolutely hammered Corbett. Some of the taxpayer groups said, we're going to tell our members that we, that we don't want them to vote for you because you won't support this. I got a call from Sam Rohr on Monday morning, this happened on a Friday that this went out. I got a call from Sam on Monday morning. He said, what did you do? I said, well, we didn't do anything except say we're not going to vote for Corbett. He said, I got a call this morning from the Corbett campaign asking how to get in touch with you because they're really worried about this. So Jen Brandstetter called me. That was the first time she said that Corbett would, would sign it if it made it through the legislature. A few months later, we talked with her again. Same thing. If it makes it, Corbett said he will sign it. Yep. That's as much as we know at this point. And we better stop right there, folks, because the library kicks us out of, out of here at 9 o'clock sharp. Thank you, everybody. Let's give a round of applause. Okay. Right. Uh, and just so you, you know, and I guess uh, Jean mentioned this, but David's been working on this, what, 10 years? Okay. All right. Eight years. So um, that's uh, that's great patience and perseverance. But um, real quick. If